met Saskia at her home in New York City. She is a sociology professor at New York's prestigious Columbia University. I know you've talked a lot about this, but I still see it as a really good launching point. Uh, born in the Netherlands, grew up in Argentina, later Italy, studied in France. We're sitting here in New York. Um, <laughs> you talk about global cities, but you're a global citizen. Uh, do you think that's the reason why you have such a fascination with it? Probably. But you know, I wonder if I would just be stuck in one particular space, whether I would not also begin to fantasize about all those other worlds. Huh? So just because one travels, I don't think is enough to explain why you would be engaged by all the different spaces. And so, who knows? What has the t pandemic taught us about globalization, do you think? That's interesting. Well, I think, number one, I, we had it coming. You know, I mean, immigration after all, it's serious stuff. And people all over the world are being expelled from what they thought was their land, their homeland. And so we see them as people who invade us, you know, perhaps, although, well, but who knows what firm, what firms in the Americas produced their departure from whatever other country where some big American firm or German firm, whatever, has actually, you know, uh, grabbed a lot of land. You know what I'm talking about, right? And so we don't see some of those histories. And that is what I started to look at. You know, I said, where does it really start? Where does this circuit that winds up with all these foreign actors, you know, from low level immigrant workers to higher level, you know, where does it really start? Is, are they the initiators? Or are we pushing them out through some sort of American or German, whatever enterprise that is working in Africa or is working in, you know. And so you begin to see a whole set of connections that are a bit different from, from the minimalism that we often use to explain, you know, a city, a condition. Well, to that point, it's interesting, uh, you know, the, the concept of the death of the city. We hear the saws and the, <laughs> this is obviously not a city that's dying, it's being built. And yet throughout the pandemic, I heard a lot of people saying it's, we're seeing the death of the city. You look at the skyscrapers yeah. with all these businesses, lights are off, yeah. people are working from home. There's no need for cities anymore. You're going to have to rethink cities. So has the pandemic accelerated globalization or has it, has it actually put the brakes on it. I mean, what has been the impact that way, do you think? Well, I do think that that's a good point. The last thing that you just said right now, because we suddenly discovered, you know what, a lot of the stuff that we imported, we can get it done here. You know, and there was a kind of a, a resurgence of local economies, especially when it came to, to certain types of foods, to green vegetables, you know, all of that. A real, and that now, the new generation is also far more interested in in having that. But the networks of global cities, they are still there and they need each other. They, they need to have all these different options. Now, the animal itself keeps changing, you know, what it means. But I do think that, and you can't quite call it internationalism because that is a, that is a different concept. But it is that they sort of need each other and the transactions can happen so fast, you know, can be matters of seconds or, or a day, whatever. So I do think my reading is that we will keep having international act, foreign actors who find an advantage in being very well connected with all kinds of, uh, you know, local and international actors. So that is one way of putting it. Saskia is a Dutch-born, internationally recognized expert and author of several books on globalization and migration. In this new era of globalization, Saskia sees global income inequality rising. I remember being in a cab one day in Washington, D.C. and striking up a conversation with a cab driver, and he told me he was a lawmaker in Ethiopia before he came here. And I think that, uh, you know, this lower tier that in America, a lot of people look at them as like they're, they're undereducated. And, and what you're pointing out is that's just not the case. Yeah. 
I mean, it's a mix, you know, but there is, there is quite a bit of talented, highly educated people who start out, you know, as cleaners. I was a cleaner too. Now, for me, it was also adventure, you know. I was a young Dutch adventurer who had just come in from Latin America. And so the world was open. And, but I know that, that there were quite a few people who, who were actually, but their, their lifelong would probably have been also to just keep on working in those lower level jobs because it was not easy to exit that. You know, it was not easy to enter another level, no matter their intelligence. So I have known cleaners who were simply smarter, quicker minds, quicker noticing, etc. Then you're, you know, the one who sits at the desk with all the papers day after day. But cities have evolved. Um, yeah. People are just getting pushed out of the cities. Yeah. Um, money's flooding into it. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you're talking about, you know, when you watch the circuitry and you go back to the t beginning of the circuit, where does the circuit begin? It's, yeah. it's the same place, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it really is. We, we are, I mean, we are, the one way of looking at it is that there are many, 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 many elements in play. And some of us start here, some of us start there, some of us start here. But in the end, we really need the full array. We could not live, people like us could not live if there weren't all kinds of other people who work at night, you know, doing this and that, making it up. And, and that is something we should never forget. We should never forget that we really depend on each other. And even if you're very rich and powerful, you will still depend on those employees of yours. And if you treat them too badly, many of them might just leave you, but you can hire others. So they have an easy, you know, whereas. But so, so I mean, we humans are really quite something. I, I <laughs> as, you trace, as you trace the transformation of cities, I mean, when did we start to see this kind of change where, because you've pointed out, you know, poor people used to live in the cities. Now they're being shoved out. Well, and one issue is population growth mixed with all kinds of new ways of uh, very advanced forms of work, you know, which can benefit from cities, though not always, but very often it's good for them to like, like you know, a, a lot of, a lot of that, that which involves money is, depends on all kinds of people working and exchanging in cities. You know, you can't, it's not like write your best book, disappear, you know, in, a, in some, and then come back in three years with a product. No, you need them right there. And so, and, and what for me, one of the issues for me also is that what is not recognized is how many of those workers get up uh, extremely early in order to get to their jobs. And then they're, of course, they're tired the whole day, and we know what that feels like. And, you know, the, I want to name that, you know, so in some of my work, I really try to name what it means to be a janitor. You know, it means you work at night, you never get to sleep enough, you probably don't see much of your kids, you know, it comes with a whole set of issues. And we, the privileged, we have a bit more flexibility, but also we are constraint in some level, in some way. No, we humans, we need so many things that we are our own sort of, you know, not this, not that. It's sort of, when you look at it that way, it's sort of weird. In 1991, Saskia wrote her most famous work, The Global City. In it, she argued that three cities were propelling the world economy. You've uh, coined the term global city. What's the difference between an international city and a global city? Well, because international city was a term at that time, and I wanted to capture a particular kind of city, which is not simply about tourists coming and hence creating some internationalism, but what represented rather an emergent new uh, uh, business mode that really needed multiple sites sort of an, a certain kind of opening, very partial opening, multiple sites across the world, not multiple sites just in one country. And, and that really is something that, I mean, started quite a while ago, 
but it really took off. You know, in the 1980s, as when you see this growing, growing, internationalism of a kind, a business internationalism, became very significant. Why that happened? You know, there are multiple vectors in play, as we like to say. <laughs> that doesn't help very much, I know. But uh, uh, so, so many buildings had to be built. There was, you know, there was this very interesting moment, say in New York City, but it also happened in other cities, when the sense was, we don't need cities. People were leaving the city, the city was dirty, the city was dangerous. Remember, the cities were not particularly beautiful in the United States at that point. And, um, and that is when that other sector, vector, etc., enters the picture, a new kind of, uh, an, a new way of using the, well, it's the money question in many ways, but distributed across so many different modalities, you know. And that was a very interesting period, and it took a lot of people by surprise, because at the same time, many people were leaving the cities, the cities were dangerous, the cities were sort of poor, the big cities, you know. And then this other element comes in play, which is that the city is a great place to do business. So I got to study, for instance, all kinds of enterprises, which actually extract a lot of what they do from all kinds of parts of the world but when the chips are down it all becomes a certain type of market and that certain type of market exists in in certain cities and not in all cities and so you have this new transformation now remember that the electronic strength moves in you know there are all kinds of elements that that enter the picture at that point that enabled you could be no matter where and you could do your business. That also meant that you could have businesses all over the world without having to travel, you know, to all of those places. So you really have, and at that point, the city uh, becomes again important because the city had lost standing. Our big cities were in trouble. They were not seen as good places. They were seen as dirty, as dangerous, as you had a lot of poor, you had homeless. A city like New York was like that. Chicago was like that. And so then comes this other, you know, the, the advancement of technologies, etc., played this different role. And then again, cities become, but the irony is that at that point, cities become so significant when it was precisely electronic strength that you would have said they can go anywhere. It was not that way. So the financial sector in, in New York grew enormously. Now, you would, a lot of the commentators had said, OK, now we are electronic, we can be anywhere. Well, yes and no. As the pandemic sent shockwaves throughout the world, global cities could be the key to resiliency and recovery. As you look at our current age that we're in now, there's so much pessimism out there, negativity. What gives you hope and encouragement? Well, the fact that I deal with students, I'm a teacher, actually brings out their perspective. So they, if they're young students, they're not necessarily heard by or recorded, you know, by the news media, etc. And they are far more positive in many ways, not in all ways, I think, than, than older people. Now, is it because the older people, people like my age, etc., is it because they have gone through much better times where when the city was easier, the city was less criminal, the city was cheaper? Or, or is it really a more foundational uh, difference, you know, that, that, that we, we really enjoyed the city a lot. And a lot of the young people don't have enough money to really enjoy the city. You know, that is sort of one little element in play. Um, but I love living in a city, I must say. I really, I think the city is a very special place. And also it's, it's the one place where you interact with everybody, you know. You may not talk with each other. 
but you're aware their presence matters. Yeah. That Including these guys over here who have been with us the whole time. <laughs> Since China opened up to foreign trade and investment in 1979, it has been among the world's fastest growing economies. How has globalization helped China lift millions of people out of poverty? I mean, I have seen few countries. I've been in many countries. I've seen few countries that had as dramatic a transformation as China. China was villages. When I first went, it was villages. Yes, there was the famous, you know, by the river there, the famous that had been built a hundred years ago or more. That was there, but nobody went there. There were no tourists. There was nothing. And so the way China changed, and I went several times to China, you know, in this research project, that's just extraordinary. It's something that we have not seen in our modernity here in the West, because our modernity started so much earlier, and you know, we were we were not alive uh, then. We didn't, li and so in China it was just emerging. And I was 17 years old, and I, it was just amazing. It was really amazing. It's been a delight chatting with you. Thank you so much, <laughs> and thanks for enduring the cold. <laughs>